Steve, how many paintings can you do before you have to do the final checkout? <laughs> you know? And uh, so that's that's the name of the game. It's like uh, make as much communication of my vision, my thoughts as possible, you know? But glad you guys can come in my studio. Same paintings. I need to switch it up. I guess you guys are getting tired of this one. But today what I'm going to do is I'm going to work on my... Uh, <clears throat> I'm gonna work on the pedestal. Then I'm gonna bounce over to this collar. I'm gonna do some work on the collar. I might do the collar first. Do some work on that. Then I'm gonna bounce up to the face and then raw, maybe on the sun. And then maybe just a little bit more texturing in terms of the wood, or the, the pattern here. I have one leg one way, one leg the next way. So I gotta figure out how that's gonna work. But I think I'm gonna have Misty Miss Go through there on that leg anyway, or on the other leg. I think I need to make the other leg reflect this one. So, but mist is gonna go over there, so it's gonna be a little bit obscured. So I'm gonna get painting on that. I'm getting painting on this and see what I need to do. So um gonna get my uh examples together. I'm gonna work on maybe probably the the, the scepter too, get the metanetra tightened up. A lot of the rest of this painting is gonna be some small brush painting, you know? Ones and zeros kind of painting. I was able to get myself some more brushes, basically for the intermediate stage of blocking. So I'm gonna start on my pedestal first. I would like to start up on my uh, collar. I may wanna do that. Let's see if, how dry that is. That's kind of dry. I may. And I may make work on the pedestal, but I've been putting this pedestal off, so I think I'm going to jump on this pedestal first and then over to the collar. So to do that, I'm going to start out with my zero, my one, and my liner brush. And a couple of these, uh, a couple of these 10 over zero brushes, you know. All right, and uh, I might get another one. I really like this. this is my Raphael brush. I got myself some more Raphael brushes. I ordered some more today. Hopefully they'll be coming in soon. So that is all good. Okay, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start today down here on the base, nice and low. Probably gonna have to work on the floor, but I'm gonna try to work somewhat, try to work on these blocks here. So I don't have to get down too low and cramp myself up, but you gotta do what you gotta do. Now I was painting on this color yesterday that's kind of tacky. It's, it's set, but it's not completely dry. It's kind of tacky dry. So that would be ready tomorrow, or I might even be able to paint into it today. But first, I'm going to start tackling on this base, and guess what? I'm going to have to get all the way down on the floor to get to it, because I and you need a comfortable painting position. So I'm starting out my day all the way down on the floor. Let me see what this, I painted on this yesterday too. That's tacky dry, even though that's brown, that's tacky dry, but that's still paint inable. I mean, I wouldn't paint necessarily wet on, on dry technique, but wet on tacky can work too. Um, I guess I should have bought one stiffer bristle brush or need a synthetic down with me. So let me go get that. Oh, I got somebody waving. Hey, you guys know I love waves. <laughs> Thank you, thank you for the ways. I appreciate it. Let's see who is this. Oh, my shawty girl. My Zulu shaw. How you doing, Lavuno? How you doing, Zulu Queen? How you doing? Always good to see you. Even though you woke me up last night, <laughs> in the middle of the night, I heard this thing go bing. I had my like volume set. You know how you got the little, little, the Wi-Fi speaker and junk <laughs> hooked up in your in your bedroom. Well, I fell asleep and I left it on. You know, it was like on high. It was like on ten. <laughs> and all of a sudden, it was like bing. <laughs> your message came and it went bing again, <laughs> bing. And I woke up. Then I answered the best I could, but I was like hallucinating. I was like, did I actually text somebody or what? You know, <laughs> fell back to sleep. I'm sorry, please forgive me. When are you selling these paintings? The room is starting to be full. Well, um, 
It's a coronavirus in the U.S. <laughs> you laughing? Look, look, Lavona. It's a coronavirus here. You guys in South Africa got it light. You know, you guys complaining? Don't complain. I'm in the USA. We getting jacked over. Trump fired all of the pandemic people and the and whole government agency. Let this mess all get all over the country. So we all jacked up over here, man. <laughs> so everybody's scared. Everybody's walking around like Darth Vader with breathers on. <gasps> with gloves on and stuff. <laughs> Head, headgear on so they don't get it in the hair. You know? <laughs> it's getting bad, man. It's like you got a spacesuit just to walk through what you normally used to walk through, you know? It's like you're on the Apollo mission to the moon and you got your space walker suit on, you know? You know, I got my equipment in the other room. I should have put it on. This is what you guys see what we're doing over here. I don't know if you guys are doing it, but you got to do it here because we got pushing, you know, we're over 60, it's like 65,000 people dead. You know, that's basically 9-11 times 25 or something, you know. So we fought some, we still fighting wars over that, you know. So, um... I don't know, you know. Who you gonna fight? You gonna fight your own stupidity? You know, that's basically what's going on, you know. Now we gotta fight ourselves, you know. Yeah, but uh, it is what it is, you know. My girl Labuna G Z from South Africa. Good that you can come by and holler at a brother, you know. It's always good when you say hello, you know. And, uh, but yeah, you kind of, um, tech, I left my messenger, I left my phone on, you know, my speakers is on, like, hi, just blasting, you know, <laughs> it's like, bing, okay, I'm awake. <laughs> well, at least I was kind of like half awake, I, because I was staying up, because I do, uh, I'm working on my design, sometimes I'm just laying on my bed, and sometimes I just draw on my iPad Pro. Uh, digital art, you know, and tell, you know, other people read books until they get sleepy and they have a book on a nightstand. Well, I have my iPad Pro. So I had my iPad Pro hooked up to my speaker and I left, you know, uh, Facebook and Messenger activated, you know, on. <laughs> and I was kind of like, you know, you flip back and forth between the drawing program and Facebook because I think I was Facebooking and talking to people at the same time I was drawing and Oh my gosh, that, that proved to be a very educational experience. So the bottom line is, next time, make sure you turn off your Facebook before you go to bed, man. <laughs> Else, you know, you can get like uh, all kinds of interesting sounds that wake you up in the middle of the night, you know, from Facebook, you know. So I'm going to start kind of on the base today. I'm going to start with the highlight colors. Because I really didn't do a lot of painting on this base. So I have basically like an off-white color. And I'm going to just paint. Because I don't even know if this is like the canvas, the naked canvas white. But I'm going to put down my own white. An oil paint. You know, wet oil paint. It's just like an off-white. It just has a little bit of uh, ultramarine blue mixed in it. And it has a little bit of um, yellow medium mixed in it and a little bit of cadmium red medium mixed in. Okay, just a little smidge to kind of give it a little warmth, give it, give the color a little bit, uh, you know, just make it slightly gray, but a, kind of like a warm, cool gray, you know? Okay, and I'm going to, and I'm basically painting right now with the number, I don't know if this is a number zero or number one, but it's a fairly small brush. I'm going to switch over to my liner brush because basically these are just little highlights. Sometimes I paint my highlights before I even paint my middles or low lights. Sometimes I do, and then I just kind of paint around those to achieve all the other tones that I need. Sometimes it's just easier for me, especially if I'm painting wet on dry, because I can keep a fairly clean, a fairly clean highlight sometimes that way without getting it muddy. And then also, sometimes the paints just take a long time to dry. And when that happens, you want to, you know, you want to be able to pre preempt that time that it takes to dry. So, it's basically what I'm doing now. 
And now what I'm doing is just mixing in a little bit more gray, or I should say cobalt blue, to kind of get into some of these uh, cool, uh, cooler highlights here that goes around the base here. And I'm trying to be, I don't have my stick, my sticks is over there. Um, I don't have my stick to help steady my hand. So I'm just painting this from the shoulder. It's probably not the best way, but I'm gonna try to go as steady as I can this way. And uh, I'm not doing bad, but I think I'm gonna go get my stick. I'm not gonna be lazy. Sometimes when I get plopped down, I just like to stay down. That's why sometimes I wish I would have just like stayed like 175 pounds forever. But you know, I'm over six foot tall, so I'm not a short dude. So I shouldn't be under 100. I mean, maybe 190. I'll be slim at 190. But 200 and plus some change, you know, pretty, pretty, pretty healthy kind of fella, you know. You know, pretty, pretty, pretty healthy little fellow here. In terms of getting up and down, this is a little bit of, a little bit of effort you got to put up in there when you're a bigger boy. But I'm still agile, as you can see. I can still go up and down. That's a good thing. So what's going on? Is want you want you want to jump in my live? Send me a, um, a DM if you want to. I'll let you get in my live and talk to everybody with me. You know, that might be a pretty cool thing. Okay, I'm gonna switch from my liner brush to a. Uh, I really want another number one. I think I ordered another number one or number two, but the one that I wanted sold out, man. From the supplier that I like dealing with now. Kind of have a, oh, here's some more brushes here. So let me get all my brushes out. Okay, so I think I have a brush I can work with. I'm going to work with my Raphael brush. Raphael. Okay, so um, <clears throat> what I'm going to do is mix a little dioxidine purple, a little ultramarine blue, and kind of just add a little tone in here. Just build a little tone right in here. And basically, uh, with this is another, it's kind of like a, a glaze sort of. I already have some black and ultramarine kind of colors down for this base. And now basically I'm going back over top that with a slightly translucent dioxidon purple and ultramarine blue, just to build that tone up more. Build it up. You know, make the paint look more interesting. You know, that's what I say. Make the paint look more interesting. You know, you could have like a really fat, flat, painterly type of stuff. Like I said, the last time I was able to go in the public, I went to the Virginia Fine Arts Museum and I saw the uh, Edward Harper exhibit. Edward Harper's uh, artwork. He's an American painter around the time of, I guess, the 1940s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Uh, maybe even the 1920s when America was a much different place than it is now. And it probably was before color photography was really uh, a mainstay. And of course, if you painted in oils or if you painted in well, there wasn't an acrylic at the time, so he's painted in oils. I mean, you have color pictures of Americana. So I guess that's his claim to fame in terms of, uh, he basically just went around America uh, to resort kind of areas, you know? He also was in, in, in like uh, Mexico. I mean, he was in the Northeast. He was in the, the areas where the more wealthier people live, I guess white kind of people that lived kind of that charm life. He kind of was at those beaches and those kind of places he liked to go. And he basically would stay at a hotel and with the girlfriend of choice, which is it turns out that wound up being his main girlfriend. 
which uh, many times he would paint her basically nude or topless or something like that. She was not only his girlfriend, but she was his number one model. And oftentimes with artists, that's what their significant other turns into, or their girlfriend usually turns into the subject of their artwork. Because oftentimes they don't have anybody but that person who's willing to do the type of uh, poses and things that they want, you know, to get done, you know. And so that person becomes like important to them and that person becomes, you know, immortalized in their artwork really at the same time. So, and I guess some people like that, you know, you got a person who's an artist, but he was able to preserve all these really interesting hotels. His artwork is basically a chronicle of what it was, what American hotels was like from the 1920s all the way to the 1960s and 70s, I guess. You know, when his when his art cycle was over with, you know. And basically his art cycle is over when he cannot produce art anymore, you know. That's usually what the case is. Um, there is some artists, uh, great artists, I mean, who basically started their career late. You know, they were already in their 40s and 50s. Before they even started to paint, they was doing something else before. Only to figure out that, okay, you know what, I think I was meant to paint, so let me just paint for the rest of my life, you know? And then I guess other artists just, um, you know, just start late, you know? They just start late. Most artists do start young, especially the ones who become famous artists. They kind of start painting and they start a professional art career at a fairly young age. And I need to turn that alarm off. I turned it on for some reason that I don't need it on anymore for, but I think I was setting it for 5.30 a.m. the time I wanted to wake up. But instead, I accidentally set it for 5.30 p.m. <laughs> so evidently, I did not wake up at the times I wanted to wake up, did I? because you can see it's going off at 5.30 p.m. So did I oversleep that day? No, because I'm the type of person I'm paranoid, so I'll wake up anyway without a long clock, <laughs> just so I don't be late to wherever I gotta go. You know, I just don't, I don't like being late to places I need to be. Kinda like a little bit of punctuality. Or punctuality. It's very importante, importante. Muy importante in Espanol. Okay, so what I'm doing now is just kind of going into the base, tapping a little bit into the highlights, and then I'm going back now into the low shadows, the darkest tones and then reinforcing those in. Now that I kind of have the highlights somewhat, you know, demarked. I'm going now into the low lights. And basically I'm gonna be dealing with those. So mostly that's uh, Mars Black mixed with a little bit of Ultramarine Blue. And uh, <clears throat> a little Doxidon Purple to create that. And really what I have is I have a little bit more of an accentuation, over accentuation of what I actually see in my reference. But that's okay. I don't mind that because uh, sometimes when you're further away from the painting, when you over accentuate something, it looks better in the painting, you know? The painting actually looks better because you over accentuated something, you know? You actually, uh, you've made it stand out more. It's kind of like uh, when showgirls wear the big mascara, you know? Up close, they look really funny looking and really weird. But uh, when you see them on the stage with that kind of big makeup, overdone makeup like that, they actually look, you can kind of actually see the accentuation that they want you to see that's in their face, you know? It's, overstate something a little bit so that when you back off from it, when you're seeing it from a distance 
it still looks good, you know. Okay, now what I'm going to do is get into some of this um, gold tone in the base here. And I'm going to go back and forth between, um, I guess, um, I'm going to mix a little cadmium yellow medium, a little raw uh, umber, a little uh, burnt sienna. And just get this kind of like golden brown going. And it's mostly raw umber, I guess, cabin yellow medium. But just a little bit of cabin uh, red medium as well. Still warm it up just a smidge because I do want it warm. And I'm going into this base. And I need it a little bit darker than that. So a little bit more burnt raw umber in there. Just to darken it up just a smidge more. And I think I'm going to stay right and then a little bit more red too. So evidently I'm having a little bit of problem on the mixing side here, but I shall get it. Okay, there it is. I had this kind of uh, kind of sketchy painting that I did once before paint got a little too wet and I needed to give it a chance to dry. Now it's dry. Uh, I didn't want it to be too wet when I tried this. And then I had so many other things to paint so I didn't paint this. Now I am. This is some little brush painting anyway and a lot of times I have so much bigger brush painting I kind of skip the little stuff you know. But I think I might try another style painting, try to do, um, I think before the year is over, I'm gonna do a hyper-realistic painting. Because I saw a person on a particular site doing some hyper-realistic stuff. And uh, I don't like it, because like I say, you compete with a G Clay machine, a printer. <laughs> and ultimately, that's what you're reduced to. But I do like the work, I like the way it looks. I like. I think a lot of people are like in awe of that kind of work. Um, Cause, you know, but I always look at a strategic point of view in terms of my art, in terms of um, where it's gonna stand, what it's gonna mean, you know, in the future. And like I say, and it, it's not gonna mean a lot in the future when somebody could just go command P, you know, <laughs> hit the print button and just produce work from a digital file that's hyper-realistic. You know, it's just, you, you know, and your meticulous painting of that is gonna kinda just be kind of like, um, oh well, to future people who see it. I mean, it's gonna look like, okay. But like I said, let's talk about Edward Hopper's uh, painting. You guys can look them up if you don't know who I'm talking about. As a matter of fact, when I mention these painters, that's if you people that's, you know, art people that's interested. Just go on your Google. Just flip on over to Google. You know, while you're looking at me, you know, don't bounce off of me too long. But, and check out some of these people I'm talking about. I mean, you can learn. I mean, basically, they're interesting people. These are interesting, like, painters. Painters. Because studying these painters actually can teach you how to paint. You know, because these are painters. These a painter is somebody who probably existed during the time before photography, especially color photography, became big, and especially before black and white photography, even or any photography came on the scene. Those are the painters you want to pay attention to. Now, painters who kind of start getting on the scene after photography, I hate to say it. You can see how the industry kind of like waned off, you know, the, the rock star status that painters had, you know, like in France and in Italy and places like that. Before photography just took over, well not took over, but just made that work seem like less godlike, you know? These people were almost revered as geniuses because they were making images that the average person just was not able to see anywhere else. 
You know, you just weren't able to see these images anywhere else. And, uh, and people desired to have images. They desired to have themselves in images. Just like today, if you go over the average suburban person's house or anybody's house, but especially a suburban house, you're going to see probably a, a large family portrait. I'm not going to talk about an eight, 8 by 10. You're going to see maybe something a little bigger than that. Like maybe up to like a 19, a 13 by 19 inch family portrait in some type of a frame in a prominent, on a prominent wall or in a prominent place on a mount or something like that in their home. And then even the really nice ones, they're going to be on canvas. They're going to get them printed they get the photograph printed onto canvas. <clears throat> okay, so what that does is, is uh, one advantage that an artist had that he was painting on canvas. So what, what are they really trying to do when they do that? What they're trying to do is mimic the artist because photography is usually done on photography paper, archivable photography paper. And even when it's framed, it's on photography paper. So why is it important but then they all of a sudden start making these paintings uh, onto a canvas because they're trying to eliminate or trying to emulate, I should say, or tap into the market of the portrait artist, the artist who just paints oil portraits for wealthier people. So the suburban people always want what the wealthy people can actually afford. They can get like a five hundred to a thousand dollar portrait done, you know. And if they're gonna sit, maybe a two thousand dollar portrait done because the artist has to come into their facility and kind of sit and, and get a portrait from life, you know. That's gonna be a little bit better than a than a portrait from um, a portrait from a, a photograph. You know, it's gonna be a little bit more challenging to the artist. But it's also going to be just a better thing because you're looking at a living, breathing person. You kind of get to pick up their their personality better, you know, because you can see how they interact, how they talk. You're not just looking at a static picture. Uh, you can talk to people, get an idea of what they're like. So when you actually start picking colors and backdrops and doing stuff like that, you give it the attitude that the people give off to you. You know, it's, it's not necessarily what a camera can do, but if photographers do that, they kind of, good photographers kind of talk to the subject a little bit before they start photographing it. You know, kind of get at one whatever topic that they're dealing with, try to understand it. And then they take the picture from that point of view. You know, a lot of pros do that. Um, and then other photographers just show up, bam, shoot the picture. <laughs> get on down the trail, you know, everybody's got their own thing. But um, but a painter has no choice but to spend time because it's just going to take time to carefully put pieces of, of tone down on a piece of canvas and create the illusion. It just takes time to do that. And in taking that time, you know, um, you learn things about your, your subject, you know. And a smart artist is going to reflect those things into whatever piece they're making for that particular subject because they're sitting there learning that stuff. They're picking that up. So, uh, but again, when you're trying to save money because the average person cannot afford a, a $2,000 or even a $500 oil painting to be done. I mean, if, like I say, you're going to sit in person, you're going to give them a photograph, whatever. Uh, because, you know, the, the painter has to make some money. They got to make a living. <laughs> they have to uh, support themselves. They have to keep the electricity. I got, right now you can see me because I have electricity on. You can see me because I can afford a Wi-Fi bill. <laughs> You can see me because I can afford like a, uh, some cameras and iPad. Oh, somebody's waving. Let me see who's waving at me. Uh, hey, there's a couple of people waving. Okay, let's see. Caesar. 
Is that Augustus, my brother? Caesar Centurion. Oh my gosh. This brother is also a centurion and a Caesar. I see you, bro. Whole tempo. Okay, Tracy uh, skip with. How you doing, Tracy? I see a lot of family that you got there, Tracy. I want this in my library when I get my permanent home. Tracy, come get it. I'm in Virginia. Glen Allen, to be precise. Come on. I'll give you, I'll shoot you my address. Pick it on up. Or give me your address. I'll bring it over. Sheila Maceo. How's it going, Sheila Maceo? How you doing? Good to see you too. Waving back to you. All right, yeah, so I have my Haru over here. I don't know, I don't know if I need to pan or not. Sometimes this thing is wider. This over here is my Haru painting. And Hot Haru or Hathor and Horus. And I call this the Kemetu Kingdom. That is Luxor Temple with the Nile River. And then of course I got Ra on the throne in the middle. I got some paintings in the background too. I got paintings all over. I got Tupac and Nipsey and Barack Obama back there. So um, there's, you know, shucks. And there's one view. I probably got about eight paintings right here. So you got plenty to pick from there. You got plenty to pick from. So if you want to come here, as a matter of fact, hit my DM. Talk to me. Tell me I can make a custom painting for you. Whatever you want. I would love to put something in somebody's home. Actually, I can make it. I can make something for whatever you can afford. You know, you just let me know what you can afford. Then I tell you from there. Okay, for what amount of money you have, this is what I can do, and I can see how I can kind of um, get that going. You know, to make it nice for you. You know, so um, that's how that goes. You know, that's how that goes. So. Um, that's what I can do. And uh, I need to get some rags going here because sometimes you do something on one day and then you kind of change your mind on what you've done and you want to undo it or do something else on the next day. So I'm having one of those moments right now where I did something on one day and my rags are erasers, you know. That's how I erase stuff. And I'm just going to get a little bit of Gamsol. I'm going to see if I can do it. I mean, this might have had 24 hours and it might have set up. Once it's set up, it adheres to the layer on, underneath it and they become one. <laughs> they become unified layers. I mean, they are layers, but, but I have some tones that I put down here that I want to slightly undo. Sometimes you think you're toning something, and you could just be making your colors dirtier, or making your brush strokes more, less, less emphasized. I do like some impasto in my paintings. Yeah, so that's, I think that's a little better. I don't know if it's better because it's wet, but I did pull up something, so. That way it's still gonna reveal more my, the painting that I have underneath it more more so. So this getting up is allowing me to kind of look at my painting, what I just painted from a distance sort of, get an idea. If I'm on the right path, I'm going to add a little bit more cobalt yellow medium to my palette. I don't think I need anything else. Uh, I think I should just put just a little bit more of um, emerald green down because I can see some. I'm going to need it up when I get further up in the pedestal. So I'm just going to put a little P word for that down on my palette. Okay, so basically it's coming along pretty good. I'm working on my pedestal there. I've got some glints of light on it, but I need I got too much light. So I have to reduce some of that. Sometimes I like to have more reflection than what I really need because so I like reflections. I like shadows and reflections in my work. So, um... However, sometimes I could put more in there without actually see. And I do paint that a lot, a lot. I have a tendency to want to paint more than what I actually see. It's nothing wrong with it. You can do it. Absolutely nothing wrong with it. But 
You just have to be aware that that's actually what you're doing because, and it should be a purpose for it, you know. It should make it look better. Everything should be designed to make your painting actually look better. You shouldn't have anything that you're adding to your paint or to your painting that actually does not make your painting look better, you know. Everything should eventually start to work together, you know, in, in unity, you know, in your painting. It all should be saying the same story, or trying to help you tell the story that you're telling in your painting. I'm just going to scumble a little bit of white in just to kind of smooth out some of these, this rougher. I mean, it is clouds, but I just want them to look a certain way. Okay, so just to use my bristle, my, uh, my filber bristle brush to kind of smooth some of that over a little bit. And I see some other kind of like tints of uh, gray that I kind of don't like the way it was painted because it's got, it's kind of dry. It's meant to be an undercoat. I do want it to dry, but it was just painted a little bit too rough. I'm just going to refine some of that a little bit with just another layer on top of that. So I wasn't meaning to paint this, but sometimes that happens, you know, you, you get the painting and it's something you painted on a previous day when you was handling that particular set of elements. And um, you see something that you missed or you see something that you could have painted better. And I go back in and, and address those things sometimes, you know. You know, and just try to, you know, refine, you know, because that's what I do at this stage of the painting is everything now is refining something that I've done earlier. You know, very little of it is me just actually having to do just painting just from, from nothing, you know, painting from scratch, you know. You know, I, I, that stage is over with, you know. Everything that's in this painting is in. Now it's just a matter of, okay, let me refine this thing, you know. Let me make this better. Can I, can I paint this little section better than what I already have down there, you know. So that's one thing about painting. It's not like a photograph. You just expose it, and then the light shimmers or a sensor or an emulsion or something. And then you just process that, and what it is is what it is. This is different. This is, uh, you literally have to see the light and put it down there. <laughs> you physically put it there, you know. It's, it's different, you know. It's a different process. And you can, you can put down what the light is, or you can say, no, nah, I'm, I'm going to do something different. You can change, you know, you can change the laws of physics to work your way. And with photography, you cannot change. And I, that's an advantage and disadvantage to that. Photography, you can't really change the law of, until you take it into Photoshop or something like that, or some photo manipulation program. Sure, when you take it into a photo manipulation program, yeah, you can go in and you can you can start to actually make art from there. And that's is that the thing we call an art, the ability to be able to manipulate the image? That's what it is. That's the difference between photography, in my opinion, and painting. You know, photography still. Yes, you can, you, especially if you, some people are pure photographers. They just want whatever the camera gives them, that's what they want. They want to capture it exactly the way their art or the way they want to express that image. Then other people actually say, well, I'm going to do some of the creativity in Photoshop. So they kind of almost have a painter's kind of mentality about how they go about making their images, you know. So what I'm doing now is just kind of smoothing out some of these gradations a little bit that I had painted earlier. And I'm really just doing a dry brush technique over this because, well not in over all of it, but over some of it, because um, this is going to be painted over with more cloud mistiness. But I just don't want it to go over, you know, too, too rough painting. I want it to go over some good painting underneath, you know, because again, there are layers, but the layers should be interesting. Uh, just because you paint over something don't mean it should be painted badly. It should be still painted good, but just, you know, it's it's going to be obscured because another layer is going to go over it and kind of obscure it. 
So what I'm doing now is trying to go in there and deal with some little areas to make them look good. So when I do go into them, you know, eventually, it will, it will be very interesting to see that layer underneath another layer of paint, you know. So that's kind of what I'm dealing with right now. Just trying to make these layers just a little bit more into us thing. Just a little bit more. Interesting. Okay, and a um, little touches here and there, you know. Now that I'm down here, you know, when I'm down here, I can just see it better than when I'm standing up, actually. Or even when I back off, you know, I back off, I get the overall, I get the overall effect of the painting. And now, I'm down here, I think I need my smaller stick here. Because my pinky finger is starting to jump into some of my, my colors, my wet colors. I don't like that. So let me just go hit some of that. Fix where my pinky finger got in there too much. Sometimes I'm not even aware that I'm doing it, so. I gotta be careful. And when you back off, you don't see it. So when you're down here, you just that's why I, uh, I use my stick quite a bit. Okay, and I'm gonna be using my stick from this point on because there's a lot of detail painting to do, and you just get more control when you use a stick this way. And at this point, control is necessary. As you paint in your tones and paint in your values, you're putting some very precise, you're putting down some very precise uh, pieces of paint here and there. And you want to keep that under control as much as you can. You want to control that. switching back and forth between brushes because I'm trying to keep like a medium tone brush then a highlight brush and so on so I'm switching around also with that and mostly these tints that I'm putting in and medium is mostly with a little it's kind of like a the accent on purple mixed with a little white and a little bit of a little bit of uh, black kind of get the, the tints that I need and I just kind of go back and forward between black and white to read to arrive to the just the right little tint so they don't come out too light or too dark I want them just right So what I'm doing is doing a lot of brush skipping around just to put these colors precisely where they need to be. And just painting in the shadows very nice, just trying to get the modeling right. Just trying to get the modeling right.
trying to stay very, use just the right size brush. I think I need to move down to some zeros, zero over zero brushes. So I can just make these lines as precise as I need to. Make these little marks or splotches of paint precise. Mix in a little bit of uh, alizarin with some white to get some little highlights and some of these gold pieces in here. So at the bottom of this gold, let's get a little highlights here and there. And reflectivity started in some of this. little pieces of tone here and there. Different little spots. I see the tone, that's where I want to put it. Using my zero something brush, I don't know what it is, zero over something or just zero, but it's a sable brush. And I'm using, like I say, white mixed with a little bit of alizarin and a little bit of cadmium red titanium white to create little pieces of highlight here and there where I need it. And where I see it. Trying to be at this moment very, very careful to only paint what I see. Trying to, anyway. I really don't want to do too much over emphasizing. I'm going to go to some that same color, but I'm going to go more to a cadmium red this time with a little white in it, with a little alizarin in it. And I'm going to start painting close to where this base is here where the base kind of starts coming up from the pedestal. I mean, where the, uh, the bloom kind of comes up, I should say. Just a little bit more warmer, kind of pink blushes in this part of the gold in here. And then some of these blushes go up into these reds. I want to start moving those up in certain places. Bring some color in where it needs to be. Okay. 
start getting some more reflectivity going on. Of various tones and glints of color, or glints of light, I should say, reflecting different tones. Going back now to mostly titanium white. I'm going back into and just mixing a lighter pink. Actually, it's just it's really it's just white with just a touch of tone in it. And uh, I see some other little blush colors in here too. Let me just add those where I need or where I see them. It's just blush tones everywhere. You know, when you start looking for them, they start revealing themselves to you. Sometimes you look at something and you don't, you're kind of looking, but you're not looking. You know, so it's very important. You know, you can look and then you can look. It's like, I guess, a musician, you, some people hear and then other people actually hear more. You know, I knew guys that could tell you that the key we're talking in, the ear, they were a very good, you know, organist or pianist. The ear was so in tune that the music was like an object. You know, they could literally, they could just tell you something. Like you could say, "Well, that's yellow." They could tell you the key you're talking in. They could just say, "Okay, that's the key of G or the key of C that you're speaking in." This other person is speaking in a different key. You know, most people don't even think like that. You know, but uh, when you work with a certain art form a lot, a certain medium, you begin to, to, to really learn that medium, you know, you start, it becomes part of you, you know, it becomes part of the way you think, and, uh, you know, part of your consciousness, you know, so uh, I think when you get to a certain maturity level, as a visual artist, you definitely start seeing things. You, your vision is different. You know, your vision becomes a little bit more heightened, I guess, than the average person. Just like uh, a Stevie Wonder can't see with his eyes, but I'm sure he sees the music. And so his sensories is, is, is lowered in one area and raised in another area. Now I'm going to take some titanium white and mix it with a little bit of uh, cadmium yellow light. I'm gonna just go hit these higher tones on this side of the vase. It's just a lot more, it's yellow, but it's just with a tint of yellow, just making it glow a little bit more. And it's not everywhere, it's just in certain places and you gotta hit the right spot. Because if you don't, then it don't look right. What I'm gonna do is get and stretch my legs again because I don't know for some reason my body don't like these little squats like this. I don't like to be curled down and squatted like this. <laughs> so um, I'm gonna have to get up after a minute. But I got some good paint going on, so I don't want to stop, so I'm kind of like stuck. What I do go into a, a temporary paralysis, sacrificing my legs. Or would I do uh, get up and stretch them and keep my legs, but then I may, I won't get to finish doing what, I, what I'm thinking I'm doing right now. <laughs> you know, that's, you know, I think Michelangelo was saying he was doing the 16th seal and he was having some issues like that. People was putting pressure on him to hurry up and finish. And he literally was sacrificing his body to get the project done. And of course, what he was mad about was that he here he is sacrificing his body and all these people cared about was going in and just kind of worshiping, you know, but that was the whole point. Yes, he's making great art, but the whole point is that the thing is a place to worship. But it's like sometimes uh, your art is just a, it's just a uh, side show to somebody else's show. And even a great master like Michelangelo, 
he was one of the greatest masters that ever lived, actually, that we know a name of anyway. Okay, so, uh, but he had to suffer. He had tremendous suffering that he went through. I don't think he really liked the church too much, man, because he had some, in his journal, he had some really nasty things to say about the, the cardinals and the, the various clergy that hired him. It was basically paying him some serious money. But he didn't like any of them too much. <laughs> I don't know if he was so religious. I think that he was, his, I think he was all about the art. And these people were just the ones that was paying for it. So it, it, it was what it was. He treated them as nice as he needed to so he can get the work, so he can get to do the work. It was kind of like he had to do a lot of butt kissing to kind of just get in position so he could do something. Yeah, sometimes you get down here so long, your legs go to sleep, and it don't even matter. It's just like they, you don't even feel them no more. They're just gone. Your legs is gone. They're just some, some things sitting up underneath you. <laughs> you know, I guess you don't want it to get too bad. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to get on up. Bah. I see it get up. Bah. Because especially this left leg here, because it's tough. It's got all my, oh man, I don't have any feeling in my left foot, right? Whoa, 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 whoa. I don't have any feeling at all in my left leg, so <laughs> that's kind of messed up. <laughs> I mean, my leg is totally uh, asleep. It's gone. <laughs> okay, so now I'm going to try to get up one more time. That was kind of bad. Okay. Uh, my whole left foot was asleep, so that was extremely embarrassing. But you know what? I'm going to leave that <laughs> in the video because I just don't care. <clears throat> Gillian, what's up? <laughs> Jerome, I got people la uh, not laughing, but uh, I guess looking. What's up? How you doing, Julian? Jer Jermaine waving. So how y'all doing? I hope maybe nobody was in the room when they saw me do my little cripple man get up from my uh, position. Wow, I think I stayed down there just a little bit too long. That leg was just really fully, that foot I couldn't even feel it. It was almost like I didn't even have a foot attached to me. All right, so too much weight on your leg, too long, and good. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do here is just stand a little bit and let my circulation get back in my leg and kind of look to see what I'm doing. What I am going to do, however, is I'm going to go over here and uh, bend over a little bit and get some more circulation moving and also look at my example. So. I think I don't need this anymore, so I got my use, my let my activities back in my legs, so that's good. No need to amputate or nothing. <laughs> you know, so um, what I'm gonna do is just look at this from the back of the room, just take a chance to get my circulation going again, and also a chance to look at my artwork objectively. And uh, and just to see that little bit of painting that I've done. Uh, sometimes you do some painting, it don't even look like you've really done anything. You know, it just looks like all you did was dibble dabble because it's a small brush, but I have done something. The left side does look a little bit better. <clears throat> the right side looks okay, but there's some more modeling I need to do in the shadow tones uh, on that base area. Definitely some more modeling that needs to be done, but it's getting there. And then, of course, I need to tamp down. Some of those highlights need to be tamped down just a little bit, or the modeling needs to be brought up some more. I mean, brought in some more. But it's looking pretty good. I don't, I think it's, uh, it's just a shadow. I need to really work with that. <clears throat> then I can start going up into that, like, flower-like plume. 
that's above the base. I think I need to hit down those to highlight some. I need to really paint that in more. Especially when you're back over 20 feet away, you really do see the places where you need to pick up. <clears throat> and I definitely need a lot more tone on that right side. It's just not that much highlight there. I have way too much. It's really throwing off the illusion. And uh, I mean, it looks okay from a, probably a very far distance, but it just doesn't look balanced with the left side. So I think I'm going to work with that black rim tone, the shadows and that next before I even start touching on the gold part anymore because that's going to going to help me paint the gold part better and see that better. So I'm going to kind of get on that more. And definitely now that I'm down there, I want to work on the feet, but God dog sitting on that floor in that Indian stance. And I think I was on mostly my left leg more so than my right leg because that leg was, I mean, my whole leg was completely asleep. <laughs> my foot especially. So I don't know if my circulation just ain't that good or what, but it was just way too much weight on it. But it's something that I probably, I need to probably budget an amount of time when I'm sitting down and just get up, sit down, get up, sit down supposed to staying down at way too long however it's looking good I like the uh, tactileness of that that I'm, I'm painting of that vase I just like it the way it's painted I painted in a very tactile kind of way and uh, it just it feels like it's there you know uh, I wish I could get some of that into the chair and I am uh, once that coat dries I'm gonna go in there with a little bit more like a yellow gold leaf kind of tone and some more textures in the chair but I, I like the bit of painting I've done on that making that just a look a little bit better and it's just a little bit better you know I could have made it just perfect you know the first time but uh, I'm trying to build up the layers the patina where you can see translucent layers and any translucent layers and build it up that way and so that just takes a little bit more time to do it that way. Uh, however, it's a it's it's nice when you do have it like that. It is nice. So <clears throat> you know, and uh, but you know, sometimes you want to put it on thicker when you do it that too, and thin thinner. You know, uh, a little bit of a combination. <clears throat> so um, okay, now that I feel like I'm somewhat. My lower body is somewhat <laughs> back to normal. Uh, I think I might get back to it again, but um, that's looking pretty good. Uh, <clears throat> maybe I should have focused on the collar. <laughs> you know, more. Actually, I'll tell you, when I see the collar like on the video, it doesn't look as good as the collar looks when I see it in person for some reason. And I think it's just, uh, you know, it has to do with the softening of the image that happens when you have to translate it into Facebook, you know. Facebook dumbs down the image quite a bit. I don't even think you, you might upload a HD image, but I think you get like a, instead of a 1080 image, you get a 720 image or maybe even below that, maybe it's like 480, <laughs> you know. And uh, any you just don't see, you know, as much as what you have painted. Now, when I, I did notice when I go to YouTube, it's a clearer the images look clearer and a little bit more true to form but there is some compression that even happens when you go to YouTube uh, say for example you shoot it in your camera and it goes through I'm using Final Cut Pro <laughs> it has to mash the image down into a HD format uh, throwing away pixels of data describing the image uh, when they throw that away, it basically there is some dumbing down of the image where you just don't see all of the details you need to. I mean, you see some stuff good. I mean, if you just, there are a lot of people who do YouTubes, it's just they're close up on the camera. You know, they're like within three feet of their camera or less. And you're going to see a lot of details the closer you get to something. But if something is further away from the camera, and because uh, you're trying to get a bigger scene because you got all these paintings you want in your uh, in your in your scene well that's a whole different matter I mean now we are in a whole different place because it's a lot of 
information that gets described by the same amount of pixels. So it's kind of like turning, when you close up, it's kind of like you turn your HD into 4K. Or if you have HD, if you get things further back, it's like turning your HD into 720 or 480, you know. And so uh, I would love to be able to get a switcher. Uh, if you guys, if y'all could just subscribe to my YouTube, that would justify me to be able to get a, a switcher so that I can switch from a close-up camera so you guys can see stuff up close as I'm painting. And then back to the wide camera. Or if I'm really good, if I can get a mixer that can do it, do a picture and a picture. Where I can like split screen to have one side of the screen where there's a wide view. Then the other side of the screen where it's a close-up. Or just have a top corner of a picture or picture in a box where you can see a close-up. And then you can see the wide view. Or you can see the wide view and you can see the close-ups, you know, whatever. And then I can just switch back and forth momentarily. I mean, that might be more interesting. I would probably get oil paint all over the switcher, but, you know, I don't want to get too expensive with a switcher if I'm going to get oil paint eventually all over it. But I want to get something that's HD compatible and something where I can do, you know, multiple cameras and maybe bring in a, a microphone sound that I can get closer, better sound, etc. But, um... Okay, so what I'm going to do is kind of um, <clears throat> go back to this because uh, I, I did have my little falling down experience there <laughs> when I tried to get up. And I think I just won't go get up. I would have had to stay kneeling for a little while, you know, or I just need to get up get my circulation going. So I'm not going to be down there for a long time anymore, not too long. I'm going to be down there just long enough. Uh, in the future so that I don't embarrass myself and fall down like that again. So anyway, maybe I can paint it on this. No, I got to get down on the floor. So it is what it is. And uh, you got to do what you got to do. So I'm going back down and I'm going to look at my, uh, my reference here. And I'm going to start to paint in what needs to be painted. And I think I might have put some brushes away that I had in my hands there. What did I do? Don't want to disorientate myself too much, but I seem to have less brushes to paint with than I had before, but it's okay. I got enough. All right, so now what I'm going to do is just hit a little bit of this kind of pink color that I have. But it, for, already I have some... Um, purplish gray here. I'm going to just hit a couple of tones here. I need my stick. So let me reach over and get that. Because if I didn't have a stick, I'd have really been in trouble. I probably, I might not have fallen because I wouldn't have gotten up so fast. So, oh well. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do is, is basically, I think it's a number one brush. I think I didn't use this one because this one is uh, a slightly cheaper brush. That's why I do like the uh, Spanish and Italian brushes a little bit better. You just do a better job, man. Yeah, I hate to I hate to be brush, be a brush knob, but they tend to do a little bit better job than say the ones made from in India and other places like that. Uh, yes, they're cheaper, but I still think you get what you pay for. And there is a difference. Uh, just the way that the hair stay together, uh, that's very important, especially when you're doing detail work, that you keep all of the hairs on your brush parallel and together. That's the number one thing you want to look out for. You don't want anything where your, your, your brush hairs is straying all over the place and, you know, when you're trying to paint a line and you wind up painting three lines, you know? Because you got one hair that's separated, or you know, two hairs are separated from the main set of hair, so they're all painting a line too. Now, sometimes they work good for you know, if you're doing something where you're doing some some trees or leaves or something like that, you kind of almost want that, you know, <laughs> you know. So you can use old brushes for effects, but 
you should really watch it, you know. You should really watch it. So, uh, or cheap brushes, I said, for certain things. But just be careful, you know. Uh, get a couple of them because they're cheap, you know. So you can have a decent, you know, uh, repertoire of brushes to pick from. However, you know, know what their strengths and, and weaknesses are, you know, as tools. You just can't paint the things that you, you would paint with a nice brush, with cheap brushes. I mean, you can try, you're just gonna not have the control. And then sometimes if you got cheap brushes, you don't even know that you can paint better because you just feel like the brush won't let you paint any better. This is the best you can do. But, and you don't realize is that the brush won't let you paint any better. <laughs> Because you just don't have, you know, the, 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 ha the hairs don't stay together or the spring back is not good enough. Or I just don't load with paint to, a, to, to the better level that another brush would. All those things are going to affect the way you put paint on the canvas. It's also going to affect uh, the way your images look going to affect that. So if you don't want anything to affect the way your images look, I say then buy yourself some good brushes. But if you don't care, if you think what you're getting is good enough with cheap brushes, then stick with the cheap brushes, you know. And stick with them, man, you know. You know, whatever floats your boat. However, for me, I just, uh, for, for what I need, I think I need um, brushes that kind of stay together with the hairs that stay together and brushes that just allow you to put paint exactly where you want that paint to go. I think that's extremely important. To, you know, I mean, when you put that, when you put that brush, when that brush contacts that canvas or the surface of the other paint that you already put down, I should say canvas, because most of the time, if you, especially you paint with sable hair paint, paint brushes, you're probably painting your second coat over a coat of paint that's already down. <clears throat> you know, you already put a layer of paint down, so you're painting oil on top of oil. Whether that oil is wet on wet or wet on dry, it's still oil going into oil, which is a different feeling, a different type of uh, handling of the brush from when you're painting, you know, when you're hitting the uh, gesso layer for the first time. For those who use gesso, whenever you hit your prime layer, now that's people who use oil primes, you know. They paint in oil and they use oil primes. Or there's people who paint in acrylic. Of course, gesso is acrylic. So they're painting on an acrylic prime. Okay, well, if you're painting on a, if you're using acrylic paints and you're painting on an acrylic prime, then you're good. You're basically still painting acrylic onto acrylic. Now, however, if you, because I do notice I, I am in some acry acrylic uh, brush painting style groups and personally uh, I paint acrylic I mean some of these paintings in this very room is acrylic <laughs> um, I won't even tell which paintings are acrylic and which paintings are oil and sometimes uh, I can paint better in acrylic than I can in oil as a matter of fact it's a different style I tend to paint more hyper realistic with acrylics then because it dries fast and sometimes when you're painting hyper realistic you really do want the, the paint to dry you just want to hurry up do his thing get on to the next step you know get on to the next thing you need to do with that you know and then sometimes you just need that thing just to stay wet so you can blend it <clears throat> and for a long time and then that's when you really start appreciating the oils, you know. So, like I said, all it really depends on what you believe you need to do with your with your paint, you know. Uh, 
But not everybody wanted to do the same thing with their paint. You know, somebody, some people wanted to dry, set up, so they can just get ready for that next move. They really want that thing to uh, just dry, get set up, just keep moving. You know, they want to keep moving with it. And they're going to paint basically wet on the dry. So people who do like to do a lot of paint wet on the dry tend to prefer acrylic. Because really they like to paint wet on the dry. People who tend to like to paint do a lot of blending and like to paint wet on the wet. They tend to work in oils. And then also people who like a certain patina, a certain kind of finish, a certain kind of uh, glow that you can achieve much easier with uh, oil, tend to prefer oils. And it's all just uh, what you get used to. You know, at the end of the day, it's what are you used to? If you were in art school and you walked into the store for the first time from high school, and your art instructor said, it don't matter what you paint with, oil or acrylic, just pick one. Someone will tell you just paint oil because they're snobby. <laughs> you know? But then someone will let you choose, and then someone will tell you try everything and see, you know? Uh, I say try everything and see because not everything works for the same people the same way. You know, some things work for some people one way and another person another way. So just because it worked for your art teacher, that's his style. I mean, that's his way, his way his brain processes making illusional images. That may or may not be the way your brain processes it, you know. That may not be that. You know, so uh, you have to be in touch with yourself as an artist, you know. You know, okay, I know I have this teacher. I know what they're saying to do this. But what do I really need to do, you know? What do I really need to do? Is this actually, do I feel comfortable? Do I feel like I can make my best images? Is there another way I can make these images? And you always got to be, you got to be a little bit of a scientist, you know. You always experiment. Is there another way that I can make the type of images that I make? You know, yes or no. And there's only there's only one person, not your professor, to answer that. It's you. There's only one person there that is properly qualified to answer that. Because guess what? The person with the brush in their hand is ultimately the one that's got to do the work. Not the person lurking over your shoulder being your art professor. That person is doing their own work, <laughs> uh, perhaps in their studio when they're not sitting there wasting time with you. And oftentimes that's what they think they're doing. <laughs> yeah. They believe that they're wasting time. They could be actually doing their own work. Most, most artists just like to do their own work, man. They like their own stuff, you know. A lot of artists is really not into other people's work at all. You ever see artists say, oh, yeah, you need to check this guy out. He's really good. Yeah, yeah, okay, all right, yeah, 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 all right. <laughs> then they might pretend like they're interested because you're so excited about that particular artist. But really, they just want you to be excited about them, you know. You know, a lot of artists is like that because they like their, they like their vision, you know. Art is kind of personal. Now, it's, it's also artists can appreciate other artists, too, because just like a, a guitarist, you know, that's that's an artist. They hear one guitarist do a certain rip and find it fascinating. And they never really conceived to play a particular series of, 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 of guitar strums that way. And then now that they've heard this, they're, they're mesmerized. That happens also. You know, sometimes I do it. I see a person, you know, like I can say, I, I see a person painting hyper realistic. I'm painting realistic, but I'm taking, painting more like romantic realistic, you know, figurative sort of realistic. Because I'm interested in telling the story. I'm more so interested in telling the story than trying to create an illusion. Yes, I have to create an illusion to help tell a story. 
But the illusion is not everything. With the hyper-realistic person, the illusion is everything. I mean, what are you doing? I'm painting a face. It's an interesting face. It's a really crippled up, gnarly face. But all it is is a face with a person, you know, they got some clothes on, you know, and it's an interesting face, and that's it. Usually when you see it, the, the subjects are very, I'm not going to say plain, but their subjects are kind of like, um, it's not like a thousand different subjects, let's put it that way. It might still be a busy street scene or something, but it's the street scene. That's it. What you see is what you get. That's it. That's all she wrote. You know? And you enjoy it because that's what they're creating for you. They're creating that illusion. And the whole thing is that that realism. And a lot of times it's better to watch them actually paint than actually see the finished painting because it looks otherwise it looks just like a photograph. It's like, okay, I see photographs every day. Okay, what else? You know? So when you see a painting, you go, oh my gosh, I can't believe like a human being did that. You know? And that's kind of like um, that's their kind of like their claim to fame. It's that's kind of um that's their magic, you know, the hyper-realistic person. That's their that's their magic that they were actually able to create that kind of um, illusion or, or create, create that with their hand. It's not a camera doing it, you know, and, and people know that they can't do it. So it becomes quite like a, a quandary, you know, to a person. It becomes very interesting, like a bit of a puzzlement that a person could actually do this. They're kind of like a, a kung fu master, you know. You know, they have some kind of like special abilities that the average human doesn't have, you know. So, um, the hyper realistic painter. Um, and I can say there's a certain amount of certain amount of swag that goes with that, certain amount of um, you know attention I guess and again it goes back around the fact that um, these images you know usually the, the whole thing that a hyper realistic person is it's what they pick as a subject just like the photographer is what he's more like a photographer than a painter because it's not his interpretation it's what he picks is very interesting and then he depicts it very very meticulously faithful. So he's found something that's very interesting to show you. And then what he does is he takes a very, very, he starts this meticulous journey of rendering this very, very interesting uh, picture. It's a very, very interesting picture. And he's, he's, uh, kind of like uh, and he's rendered it you know so first of all it has to be a very interesting picture well it takes it away if you do something hyper realistic and the picture has no real power no real interest by itself as a picture but if you took it because first of all most of the time if you see a hyper realistic uh, painter there is a foot camera somewhere there is a photograph and they're very, very, uh, and it's a very good camera. And uh, it can take a lot of details. It's usually a camera that actually can capture quite a bit of information. Usually, uh, the way they like to gather this stuff is usually a camera that works very, very good with low lights, you know, or no light. It's only a camera kind of like that. <clears throat> and... Um, now let me get up, hurry up and get up for my legs lock up again. So I can feel them starting to lock up. I'll just, just get these one or two things before I get seriously legs go completely asleep again. 
Don't need to do that again. So now let me get up. Let's see. But this time let me get up slower. Because my leg could be completely asleep again. Sometimes you don't even know until you get completely up. And it feels like it is not as bad as it was, but pretty much jacked up. Okay, so anyway, let me get my bearing again, get some circulation going. And now I'm going to back up from my uh, camera and uh, check out what I did. See if it's better or not. <clears throat> and it looks better. Yeah, it definitely looks better. <clears throat> yeah, I like that. And um, uh, there is some more modeling I want to do. I'm going to take away some of those uh, highlights. This is a little bit too much. Then I want to blend some more into some of those shadows on the right side to kind of just tamp them down just a little smidge. But I think that's pretty good to let that set up and move on. <clears throat> I am going to hit some of the reflection just to put some tints in there because that white is just too flat. It's just not, it doesn't have the modeling in the highlight that I like to have. So those are some things I need to do. And then what I'm gonna do is move up. So there's a little plume flower things in the next level. I kind of see that little pedestal as different levels of motif, different levels of types of painting that I can do. And it seems like I'm putting a lot of time into that little pedestal, which I thought that I would, but I got a lot of painting done. Um, I need to work on Rod's face. I need to work on the collar. I need to work on the scepter. And definitely I need to do the cloud puff and the little comet thing and the falcon. But those, those are just, the paint is still there. Those are just um, just sharpening things up. So um, I'm still working on my other design, you know? <laughs> and if I had that design like ready to go, I'd be ready to finish this thing. I'd be like really moving hyperactively fast, trying to get this over with. But I can actually afford to kind of, I'm not gonna say take my time, but go at a normal pace because I'm not really ready on those other things yet. I'm just not really there. So um, what I'm going to do is just I'm going to relax. I'm going to kind of um, just paint these things in a relaxed way and let this paint go. You know, let this painting keep going, keep developing. I might even touch back on my camera tube painting and let that develop some too. Just let them keep developing until I'm ready for my next painting because it takes just as much time to develop your concept uh, on work paper or on digital concept or digital like a Procreate or Wacom tablet, Photoshop, whatever you're doing. Uh, you have to, uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, people use a Wacom tablet and, photo and, and Photoshop. Other people use... Um, <clears throat> You know, Procreate, I use Procreate and the iPad because it was available for iPad. <clears throat> However, um, uh, <clears throat> However, you know, uh, whatever tool you use, and sometimes, I, like I said, I just use Prisma pencils and paper and or graphite or charcoal, you know. There's a lot of things I can use when I'm developing my uh, when I'm developing my concepts. There's a lot of things that I actually use. I don't just um, I don't really stick with one particular thing. It's just whatever I, I tend to want to work with. You know, I just work with it. You know, whatever is more convenient. Like I say, when I need to be more mobile and still design, I use my iPad and Procreate. So I tend to be mobile a lot. So. I'm using that quite a bit. <clears throat> I just love that. I do have a Wacom tablet. I do have Photoshop and other programs that I can use to draw in, but uh, they don't allow me the mobility. I'm still stuck in front of a workstation, sitting on my butt in a chair. You know, sure, I'm not sitting on the floor cutting off my circulation, but I'm still sitting in a chair, and that's not the best either, you know? And of course, uh, you know, you have to spend some money to get your ergonomics right if you're working in a digital setup like that. You spend almost just as much money just on your chair and your desk and 
ways to elevate the Wacom tablet perfectly and your screens. You almost spend just money just doing that stuff. Putting your screen at just the right height, putting your um, iPad and stuff just at the right height, your desk, your chair. Then you do because you're going to wind up spending hours. It's like you see me today. I spend four hours, five hours, six hours plus each day on a painting. <clears throat> That's a lot of time that your body is fixed in various positions. You know, it's kind of like um, working out, but instead of working out for 30 minutes to an hour, you wind up working out for four, five, six hours straight, you know? And it looks like you're just sitting there, but you know, you're contorting your body into different shapes. You're standing up, you're getting, you're sitting down, you're walking all around, you're moving around. It's quite a bit, especially when these things start coming off the easel and you're painting the sides. I took both of these big paintings off the easel, put them on the apple boxes, walked all around it and just painted the sides of them, just making sure uh, the paint treatment was even on the front and on the sides because I want these paintings to look nice when you see them from the side too, just in case the person who purchased the painting does not want to frame them. I mean, this would be a big, <laughs> this would be a big installation in somebody's very nice size house with the frame, but it would be a masterful piece. I mean, with the frame, Oh my God, uh, you're really making some statements <laughs> about your about your space, especially if you're the type of person who's gonna want these kind of images. There's definitely some over the topness to that, you know, <laughs> or over some grandiose, I should say. Uh, but that's what I do. I do. I like grandiose images. You know, those are my kind of images. So, um, like I say, I know people who paint flowers and girls in uh, uh in in a uh, in the grass smelling flowers and um mountain scenes with beautiful clouds and things and lakes and oceans and a deer and stuff and a cabin in the woods i know people to paint all that kind of stuff but a lot of people paint that <laughs> a ton of people and bob ross did it better than anybody you know and it's so easy man you go step one step two step three it's done it's it's uh easy painting you know uh painting foliage and stuff like that and it's some of the easiest stuff most relaxing kind of uh painting you can do so if you're doing painting for therapy that's some great painting some bob ross style stuff because you can get those kind of natural images you know of nature from your imagination sort of you know i mean he don't have to look at anything to paint he just imagine what he wants the painting to be it creates kind of like an illusion uh, when you look at the paint up close, you can see it's a painting. But when you back away from it, it looks like something you've seen before in nature. It looks like a postcard that you've seen somewhere. You know, a photograph that you've seen perhaps somewhere. It looks like that. Now, you're not going to see Ra on the throne up above the earth. <laughs> in nature, you know, you're just not going to see that. You know, you're not going to go wisp, 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 and there it's done, you know. You're not going to see Tupac and Nipsey in an urban uh, scene in an alley with a gnarled up city like that, with that kind of, you know, you're not going to see it. You're not going to see Haru back six, 7,000 years ago and Kemet doing his thing. You're just not going to see those kind of things. It just takes time to paint those. And that's the kind of images that I'm interested in. I'm interested in fantiful images, images is that, that a camera cannot find. 